<laughs> I'm a I'm theoretical physicist, and like many people coming from quantitative fields, one learns a lot about evolution, but almost never sees a number anywhere, and starts getting puzzled by that. And so I and several others have moved into trying to understand evolutionary dynamics in the in the last few years. So, you want to go ahead and, and make a question okay. or comment yeah. first, and then we'll turn to our other panelists in sequence. Yeah, so I just had a, a couple of comments. One of them, she was an aspect of the evolution which you mentioned, but very much in passing, which is that the really evolution of cancer, there's a lot of it maybe associated with co-evolution of the immune system, which all the action of our um, adaptive immune system is an evolutionary process, and the cancer itself. And that uh, understanding that um, co-evolution may in the end be an, an important part of it and may also um, be something which could lead to um, other ways of helping the immune system rather than hurting the, uh, um, the cancer in a, in a, a direct way. Um, the other comment what I just wanted to make was about some of the, the quantitative, uh, um, quantitative issues. There are lots of papers on, on cancer and dynamics of cancer that put in mutation rates or do some simulations and so on. And they all look very nice and they get in nature and things. But if you start looking at them, you realize that if you try to extrapolate from the parameters and the re regimes in which the simulations and the modeling is done to anything that might plausibly re be realistic in a human, that they just way off and it immediately become not a viable scenario rather than a, a viable scenario. So that's something which one really needs to get in all of these, and I think Carlo mentioned the issues about you know, how many cells there are that are involved, and that being an important, important one, what the mutation rates are, are there many, many possible mutation routes to any, any given cancer, you know, what are the intermediate mutations, and so on, um, uh, so on there. So those are all um, um, extremely important things, and somehow bringing together those much more into the, um, into the field, I think, is, is, is really important for the, um, for the progress. Yeah, let me make one comment about that. The thing that I've always found most surprising, pretty much in any model that I've done of cancer, has nothing to do with the findings that come out of it. It's, how, it's discovering how many basic things are not actually known. Because in order to do a model, you have to put in parameters for mutation rate, for population size, for all these things. And it's really astounding how little there is in the literature that is in my mind just absolutely basic about cancer. Even you know, even if you're not taking an explicitly evolutionary perspective, there are many many other reasons why you might want to know what is, what the mutation rate is or what the population size is. For example, nobody has directly tried to measure the selective benefit of a cancer mutation. The so knockout p53, how big of a fitness difference does that cause? No one's directly. That's, that's like the simplest, most basic evolutionary experiment you do, but no one's measured that. So we're just sort of guessing when we're putting and making these models with relevant ranges. Okay, let's go on to our second panelist. Dan Blumstein is one of the two people who we've encouraged to come from a distance. Everybody else is from the Bay Area on purpose. He's the chair of ecology and evolutionary biology at UCLA, and he has a vision for how evolutionary approaches could do all kinds of things there and here. Go ahead. Um, thanks. Uh, I really like those talks. Um, I, among other things, uh, study marmots, which are big ground squirrels, and um, I'm, I study social evolution and, and social behavior. With respect to um, Athena's talk, um, have you thought about social embeddedness or network relationships among cells? So some of our work with marmots, for example, um, shows that socially embedded individuals are less likely to disperse. So there are resource relationships, but there also are social relationships that, that could modulate dispersal tendencies. And then I have another question. Yeah, that's a really fascinating idea. And there's a sort of cool analogy um, to network embeddedness in cancer, which is to what extent are cells actually attached to their neighbors? So in, you know, in the body, our cells are attached to neighboring cells, and that's a... That's the way our body you know, has an architecture that makes any sense. And one of the things that cancer cells lose early on is that connection to their neighboring cells. And that is one of the reasons, in fact, that they're able to disperse. But then the dispersal might be related to that, that, that subset of those that, 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 if you can modulate that, if you can maintain those social bonds. Yeah. yeah. There's a related very hot field, which is called microenvironment in cancer, which is all these supporting cells, fibroblasts, immune cells, so the things that are in the environment, um, have clearly a very strong effect on the behavior of cancer cells. And there's dramatic uh, experiments where you put a cancer cell in, a, in the blastocyst of a developing mouse, and it acts like a normal cell. Um, 
So, so that leads people to think, well, maybe we should really be just modulating the <coughs> microenvironment. And there's certainly handles there that are interesting, and I think it does relate to the embeddedness. But there is this interesting tension that the cancer cells often evolve as these independents. They no longer listen to the, the signals from their, their neighbors. So there's, there's clearly sort of both things kind of happening there. Not only do they evolve independence, but many of them actually evolve to sort of exploit their microenvironment. So induce the fibroblasts around them to produce growth factors, for example. So if, if I could ask another question. I mean, I, I guess one thing from taking an evolutionary ecological view of um, disease is that you want to think of the organism as an organism. You want to think about um, things interacting together. So given that life really is a complex homeostatic system, from first principles, because you guys have thought about this, um, can you think of some strategies that might be better approaches to think about managing, uh, studying cancer than others? Um, taking aspirin, for example, is great, except it's affecting lots of other things in the body, maybe good things. But, but you know, what, 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 what sort of a first principle approach that you might want to, you know, a, a integrate this sort of homeostatic uh, process? Uh, it's a good question. It's a hard question. Um, I struggle with it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, I mean, I guess one of my um, hypotheses about these anti-inflammatory drugs is related to this ancestral mismatch hypothesis that that our ancestors had a lot more pathogenic exposures, and so our immune systems were probably really ramped up to deal with that. And in our modern environment, we're not, not getting that. So maybe the anti-inflammatory drugs are actually generally good for us at a system level because they're sort of ramping us down. Um, and some of the, the you know, unintended consequences of having the ramped up immune system, and this gets back to the life history trade-off that Athena was referring to, is that you're willing to tolerate a lot of damage to your body if it's going to you know, preserve you, prevent the death from the infectious disease, if you're going to get cancer 40 years down the road, no big deal. But that's a big deal to us now. Um, so maybe, so I mean, I, I don't feel like that's a great answer to your question, but that, that is the way that I've been thinking about these NSAIDs. I mean, I think about slowing down the mutation rate as a sort of system level um, way of messing with the, the system um, or addressing any of these other parameters of the rate of evolution. And just one speculative idea. So. I've been thinking a lot about these issues of resource dilemmas in cancer, and one of the things that is unique in our modern environment is the availability of tremendously high levels of caloric intake, including really high levels of sugar. And people within the cancer field aren't necessarily thinking of these issues that are going on with metabolism at the organism level being potentially related to issues that are going on with metabolism at the cell level. And I think that's a connection that if we start making it, we may find some interesting levers for affecting the evolution of resource use in cancer cells. And then one might have to affect the microbial ecology and the evolution of that too, because that yeah, probably has exactly. a big role. Okay, we have one more panelist, uh, Casper de Klerk from North uh, West Venture Partners, has been involved in developing institutions and, and pharmaceutical companies and cardiovascular devices for many, many years. What do you have to say about all this, Casper? Uh, it's interesting just coming to this as an outsider. I've been interested, actually, part of the HumBio program as well. I, I got an MBA here and an immunology degree, but my one of my favorite classes was Sapolsky and then Humans and Viruses, which was uh, Bob Siegel. Learned a ton a lot about a huge amount about evolution there. Um, I guess the question I have really from a just coming in from a dark venture capital side, uh, and and uh, you know we evolve as well. We have to live in this you guys environment. Guys are angels, right? Right. Um, it's just coming at it from a um, a direct economic impact and, and which presumably would provide funding for further research is coming at it from the back end. So I was very interested in your paper. I read your paper on the metastases and that seems like a very good place to start. Um, there's a lot of interest in, for example, circulating tumor cells. And I guess what's really interesting is the, the fact that these seem to be clonal, but when they end up in a new microenvironment, you get completely different phenotype. Um, so curious how, you know, the modeling can only take you so far. How far have you gotten in terms of finding good animal models or metastatic biological models um, that represent um, some way of approaching disease um, more effectively? Do you want to talk about the liver cancer? So uh, one of the, the predictions from the model is, is that any time you have this sort of patchiness of resources, you'll get more selection for cells moving to the more richer patches. And so one of the big problems in liver cancer is who to give a liver transplant to. 
And their question is, has it metastasized yet or not? So what, one thing we're looking at now is using spatial statistics to measure the degree of patchiness in the biopsies of the liver cancers to predict who actually had metastases and to, to help that, that clinical problem. And I guess the other question I have is with respect to combination drugs, one of the things that we're constantly struggling with is the FDA takes a very rigorous scientific approach and says, show me that one drug works, show me the other drug works, show me that they work in combination and there's synergy there. And um, that's just too slow a process, I think, particularly if you're looking at sub, well, maybe not sub-therapeutic doses, but, you know, um, slowing, slowing down tumor. Um, I don't know if you've worked at all with the iSpy program, Laura Esserman, other ideas like that where, there, where you both have regulatory approval to do some experimentation, um, obviously with ethics approval, but the ability to use different combinations and... I think the other central area in, in oncology is, or infectious diseases are that you wait for resistance and then apply the next drug, mm -hmm. as opposed to maybe doing things in combination much earlier on, but that's completely antithetical to the way medicine is practiced at the moment. Right, yeah, this is a big open problem, and, and I appreciate the, the comment. This applies to that CML talk, um, result that where you have the, the Gleevec initially, and then once you get to resistance, you apply dizatinib. Though The next obvious question is, well, should you give them both at the same time up front and see if you could prevent the resistance altogether. And it becomes complicated because we don't know what kind of interactions there are in terms of toxicity of putting them together. Can you use the same dose? Would you have to ramp down? And where, how you went out? So I agree there's, there's really important questions about these combination therapies. And we'd certainly take inspiration from HIV that, that you know, it's, it's, it's the uh, evolution proofing type approach, um, but it has to be test, hasn't been tested basically, and, and it ought to be. Okay, that's wonderful. Let's go on with questions from the audience, please. I found that fascinating, thank you. Um, I was struck by, oh sorry, Steve Jurdson, I work at a venture capital firm, I have no prior experience in any of this. Um, but I was struck by how the vector of evolution seems to be at the highest level of abstraction, that of uh, signaling networks and, uh, ne and just networks between cells. And I was also struck by, um, I guess, uh, Athena's t uh, comments about the homologs, what seem to be homologs to bacterial systems in migration of cells. So I was wondering, um, Specifically, when you look at, let's say, bacteria, you know, in a resource-rich environment, um, doing quite well, and then when starved, growing a flagella, following a gradient that sounded almost exactly like what you were describing, and I know some recent work in jamming the quorum sensing signals has had great effect there in, in a sense, making, you know, a, a modal shift back to local reproduction, not propagation. I was wondering if, by analogy, there may be a way to actually, again, jam the pathways to make it think it's resource-rich, but, and therefore not modal. And, uh, you know, does that bear fruit? Um, similarly, perhaps, you know, trigger a biofilm kind of analogy in cell-to-cell -cell communication uh, instead of uh, one of uh, individual agents. I think those are all great ideas. And, you know, we wouldn't even necessarily need to trick the cell into thinking that it was a resource-rich area. This kind of approach actually suggests that we might want to do something morally reprehensible like feeding the tumor. And that perhaps we might have a bigger tumor but fewer metastatic cells. In fact, there was a related experiment where um, through a genetic manipulation, they were able to make a tumor less patchy, so the resources were uniform across the tumor, and they saw that the uh, amount of metastases went down dramatically, and this is in a mouse model. So, but, but actually messing with the sensing of, patching of resources or messing with just the migratory uh, network, so the genes controlling migration itself, uh, those are all interesting um, approaches that people have been so focused on killing the cancer cells they're not, haven't been exploring. Uh, David Stone Wilson, if, if every uh, case of cancer is an evolutionary process in its own right, then one strategy for therapy would be to study the individual patient intensively enough so that you would actually be monitoring the evolutionary uh, process. And that would require taking the data, processing the data, and then taking the next step in a way that was uh, cost-effective and and, and time effective. So is that viable? Can you imagine actually doing the kind of research on an individual patient that had that kind of feedback? Is that, is that feasible? Um, yes, in a limited way. So certainly, ideally what I want to do with the tumor is sequence the genome of every cell, of all trillion cells, um, individually. But that's clearly not feasible at the moment. Um, what is feasible is uh, having assays for specific mutations that you know are either resistant to your drug or targets for your drug. People are mainly focused on the targets for the drug, but what they should be looking for also is, are there resistant clones in there? And you have to have a, a, a 
much more sensitive tests for that because they could be in a, a very small minority. But you could certainly monitor specific genetic or epigenetic or phenotypic changes uh, over time. So, so uh, those levels are done, in fact, I mean, we, we routinely take biopsies and, and measure some property of them. And what we're just talking about is being able to get some data about the heterogeneity in there as well. Can I just, for well, the next question, make a follow-up uh, comment? One has to, it seems to me one has to be very cautious as to what one can hope to be able to do. Because even in the absolute simplest experiments with E. coli in the lab, in a simple environment where you understand everything, it's very hard from figuring out the mutations that are there to figure out what's actually gone on and never mind what might come next. And so I think the, in some ways that the phenotypic approaches and really looking at what the, the cells are doing in things and the tissues are doing and what's, what's going on, um, I would guess is, is really going to be much more productive than the genetic approach. And I certainly wouldn't want to sequence a trillion cells even, or look at the data if I had. <laughs> well, I, yeah, just to comment on that, we, um, at a previous company, we invested in a company called Oncomed uh, working on cancer stem cells. And so, you know, very reductionist down to maybe 0.2% of the population and very clearly demonstrated that if you take those few cells and put them into a new animal, that you get the reproduction of the complete, the complete phenotype and genotype. Um, but it turns out that when you look at those cancer stem cells that seem like a homogeneous population, if you then use fluidime, you see, you know, 50 cells, 50 completely different uh, phenotypic characteristics, even though it's genetically identical. Um, Not even and they're genetically identical. Yeah. yeah, and they're just all over the place. So, uh, you know, what do you do? I, I sort of, therefore, with with respect to personalized medicine, I think you're you're averaging for the dominant phenotype, but that still doesn't address the question of metastases. Well, that, that's been the big problem in cancer biology: is you take a tumor sample and you grind it up and you treat it as if it's homogeneous. And this is what what Athena was referring to. Uh, we have this essentialism bias to think of something as a unitary homogeneous. We call this thing. studying a cow by looking at a hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point, and move to our next question. I, Isaac C. Hanover, I'm an investor at Kleiner Perkins. So first of all, if you want to uh, uh, sequence tumors, we have a company called Foundation Medicine, so I'd be happy to, to do the plug as, uh, right. as a responsible investor. But my question is, uh, <laughs> is more from the translational side. So historically or traditionally, the way we approach in the clinic is on a line basis therapy where patients fail one line and they go to the next and the next. Do you have any sense on whether it's too late? Because historic, you know, where you where clinicians would normally start is those failures, and have we gotten to a point at that point that the cell, the cancer cells, have adapted to such a state that you wouldn't be able to actually affect any kind of efficacy or change? So um, I, th I think there are hints that as they get, as they go through more rounds of selection, that they actually getting are getting more aggressive. And you do have this multi-drug resistance phenotype, so it's possible that selection under one drug can actually cause failure to a bunch of other ones. So I don't think it's been studied rigorously, um, but we are getting, we do have anecdotes and hints that that's true, that, that these sequential um, drugs may be sort of losing the game worse and worse or more, quit more quickly. But it's still an open question whether putting them one by one, you extend life longer than if you put them all in the same time and maybe you know, maybe put them all at the same time and the person dies after 10 years, but maybe one by one, they each take three years to fail, but you can use 15 drugs or whatever. Um, it, it's, those sort of quantitative questions are, are all open, unfortunately. Um, Anula Jayasuriya, biologist and investor. Um, I, I would like to understand um, the trade-offs that are made in a system where there is a, um, a balance between a parasite and its host. Um, and where there is an alignment between the parasite's longevity and the host, like in a, in a tapeworm, for example, versus a, a, a virulent virus or a cancer cell. And is, it, is, there, is there an understanding of how these, uh, these trade-offs are made for the different systems? And is there one way to convert from a virulent scenario into a coexistence type of scenario? Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to take the first half, and then I'm going to throw it to Athena to talk a little bit about life history, which impacts this. So the, the issue with infectious disease is that the infectious agents have to live long enough to, and to be able to get to a new host. So this is not the case in cancer, right? So, um, <clears throat> so it's not the case that you can put selective pressure under cancer cells to wait long enough that they can in infect new hosts, with two cute examples, or cute, cool examples, I should say, Tasmanian devils and, and a dog's um, venereal sarcoma. Um, but not in humans that we know of. So that whole dynamic about evolution of sort of reduction in virulence 
doesn't really play out in cancer. However, there are questions, and there's a whole theory called life history theory that can change that um, can make predictions about how we could select for more benign tumors. So let me let Athena talk about that because she knows more about it than I do. Yeah. So one of the issues with life history theory is basically this notion that there are trade-offs among different things that organisms can invest in. Um, and I meant, as I mentioned in my talk, investment in the soma, in the body, includes things like monitoring your body for if there's intruders in there, which actually include your own cells that may be cancerous. So there's a certain amount of um, investment that the body does which requires resources um, to keep any potential neoplasms under check. And Including preventing mutations, so you can do more or less monitoring of the DNA. Exactly, so as cells are, normal cells are dividing, there are a number of processes that go on at the sort of cellular level that are regulated at the cellular level for looking for DNA damage and correcting it if it's there. And if your, your cells are spending less energy doing that, they may have more energy, your body may have more energy for other things like reproduction. And there, there's some really interesting other potential ways that there may be trade-offs. So the ability to even um, have a successful implantation, so to conceive, is likely to be affecting the way the whole um, tissues are likely to respond to invaders. So there's some evidence that breast cancer and ovarian cancer may be more likely in women that have higher fertility. Uh, and these are all just sort of suggestions that are out there in some limited data sets. But I think that there's some really important trade-offs that may be going on between having sort of, you know, early reproduction and potentially being more susceptible to cancer for a number of reasons, which might include you know, less focus on DNA damage at the cell level and also maybe having tissues that are more susceptible to um, other cells, you know, unfamiliar cells exploiting them, basically. So we have a research project where we're trying to look at what kind of selective pressures could we put on a tumor to select for a slower life history, cells that invest more in DNA repair and less in dividing. Okay, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Athena and Carlo, and to our panelists.